Jesus. You are that wonder-working God. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for the miracles that we've seen, oh God, that you never you never stop working on our behalf. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You are our good, good Father. We bless you today. We praise you. And in that song, it has raised up our faith. So I want to bring Carol Privity right into your throne room. For whatever reason that she's in the hospital right now, we're speaking to it, and we're saying that mountain has to come down. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, whatever's going on in her body that has caused her there, that we speak to it and we say, come down now in Jesus' name. Leave her in Jesus' name. And Father God, for Carol Malinowski, just want to pray, Lord God, that she hears the voice of our God, that she knows she knows where you want her to be. And so, Father God, she follows hard after you. And you will speak to her, Father God, even at this moment that she's realizing all that your blessings and all that you have for her, Lord God. So we thank you for her life. Thank you for Carol Privity's life, Lord God. We bless you and thank you this day that you are a wonder-working God. You, you heal, you raise the dead, and you find places to live. And so, Lord God, we're depending on that. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. So do we have any first-time visitors? Raise up your hand. <laughs> yes, we have Abby here today. Praise the Lord. We've known Abby forever, but this is her first time visiting us, so we praise God that you're here, Ab. Hallelujah. Uh, on Facebook Live as well, that um, if you're first time to us, then put it in chat, and we'll get back to you. Amen. Okay, so here's the instruction for next Sunday. If you, if you were here Sunday, I gave it all to you. But now it's a refresher course, so now listen up. So next week, after or this Sunday, after our service, we're going to dedicate our new basketball net, and um, we're going to have some hamburgers and hot dogs, and uh, we need you to sign up at the welcome table. So I said that probably, what, four times on Sunday? Sign up if you want to come so we have enough food. Um, we are seeing even the neighborhood children are asking to use this basketball net. And so we're just believing that this is a, a little avenue that the kids are going to come and, you know, have fun together and that our kids who are in Bible study with our wonderful teachers um, and our staff, that they will want to come too. Amen? So that's what we're going to pray uh, all together and trust God for that. Um, if you are coming, because you signed up in the sheet, that means that you can bring either a dessert or a side dish, okay? So you, I'm getting to it, Sunita. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> That's all right. I, you, always, you are always right there with me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yes, and as Nina has said, please bring a chair to sit on, or you'll be standing to have a hot dog. <laughs> Amen. So bring a lawn chair. All right, I think that, any questions about that? No, everybody's good? Okay. Oh, no, no wheelchairs. <laughs> so, and we prayed for Carol and Carol Previty and Carol Melanoski. Just keep them in your prayers. You know, Carol um, Melanoski is uh, waiting to see where God has her to live. Um, she's in Florida right now. I know her heart is here, too. So we're waiting to see, you know, what God wants to do. And um, and Carol Previty is in the hospital, and, uh, you know, we're just believing God that she's raising, rising up and coming home. Amen? And also I wanted to mention about Hannah's heart. So Hannah's heart is a phone line that we all come on 
many of us, and we pray for one hour. We get on about 825. We pray till 930. And we come on, and everybody has a prayer request, or everybody is speaking. You know, it's for our nation. It's for, it's for everything. You don't have to come on with something specific, but as God leads you, you will speak it forth, and we'll all come into agreement. Amen? And I think that's it. So if we can please stand for a moment. So, Father God, we praise you and we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, Holy Spirit downloading all of his information that is becoming revelation through to our hearts because Pastor Deb studies and shows herself approved unto you and unto all of us. And we are so thankful for her um, great wisdom and revelation knowledge that she brings Father, we thank you for uh, the tithes and the offerings that we can come into your throne of grace and present them to our awesome high priest, Jesus Christ, and he presents them to you so that you can open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon all of us. So we thank you for each and every giver, Father. We thank you for their faithfulness to this ministry to see lives changed, and we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' precious name, amen. And you may greet one another.
so glad to have you here today. My beautiful, wonderful, smart, healed, delivered, destined for destiny. What else can we say? Skinny. What else? The tree. I was Teresa. Slender. Everything I tell me I think is slender. I think about that. Those two girls with that slender character. So I don't use that word. What was his name? His name was Slender, wasn't it? Slender Man. <laughs> anyway, well, this is going south before we even get started, right? Anyway, good morning. Good morning, Facebook. Pull up a chair. Come on down. Join us. We're so glad you're with us today. Hey, today is the first day of summer. First day of summer. So I want to be the first to say happy summer to you, which makes it also the longest day of the year. I'm so glad you get to start your longest day out with me. <laughs> Maybe we can just preach for another hour or so ago. And I got something else to tell you. Guess what? Today is National Cookie Dough Day. So have a cookie. See what happens when you miss Tuesday? You miss some important information, right? To not be able to get. So have a cookie. Don't act shy. I know you eat cookies. Come on, they're all looking like... A cookie? Me? <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> Come on. So anyway, uh, yes, yeah, so stay tuned for some more important, helpful information from Faith School Tuesdays. Anyway, uh, well, we are still in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Oh, I'm glad Roxy's happy. See, it's her fault that we've been in here for nine weeks. Anyway, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking because I'm wondering if we're going to get through chapter 11 today. Everybody say, and ye of little faith. But I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, I'm not concerned if we're going to get through chapter 11. I'm wondering if we're going to get through verse 32 because we've been on that for like four weeks. So it is just amazing. We've had a really wonderful time being in this. Um, can we at least get to, to verse 33? Well, we'll see. In the meantime, we have a whole box of cookies per each side, so you can have a few of them. Anyway, so as you know, hopefully you remember, uh, we have been in verse 32 of chapter 11 for quite a while. We've seen, I'm going to call them uh, the bundle, a bundle of men, uh, six of them to be exact. We've looked at Gideon, Barak, Samson. Last week, we looked at the stunning and amazing story of Jephthah, if you weren't here last week. Um, I think you remember, if you were here, I should say, last week, I think you may remember that I said, I don't think we're done really looking at this stunning story. Just tucked away in the book of Judges, the 11th chapter, he was a judge of Israel, and yet most people don't really even recognize or remember his name. Well, what I said was true, because we carried over the story of Jephthah over to Sunday service last week and continued with that story. So um, go ahead and get the CD or look online at it um, because it's a pretty amazing story and I believe the Lord took us there for Father's Day in a very very tangible way something I think that was really directed to all of us certainly for dads out of the story so anyway get the CD or check it out online um, so the next thing we're up to is hopefully to finish this chapter today so we're going to be back again at verse 32 but we're not going to look at what we've already seen, Jephthah's in the past. We're going to look at now the person of David. David, I left some room in your study guide for you to kind of just pull out what grabs your attention as we go through the teaching today instead of me focusing on every little sentence. So you just, you know, kind of pay up and attention and see what grabs your attention. First of all, I want to say is uh, David probably is one of the best known of all the Hall of Faith. You know, we've been, we've been saying for a couple of weeks it's amazing the people that are in this hall of faith, not so much that they got in, but the ones who aren't in it. It's just so amazing to me. Um, but he certainly is one that we don't have much trouble putting in because we all know that David has this tagline, this theme that seems to follow him. If you saw the David production, oh, if you didn't, please run to the, to the computer as fast as you can and get yourself a ticket. But um, that theme throughout that, and of course his life, is that he was a man after God's own heart. 
and not to just bring up some background um, from his life, but again, he's interesting because it wasn't all rainbows and flowers in David's life. Um, I, I want to say in reference to him, there are lots of names in the Bible, right? And lots of those names double up with, with people a second and third and fourth time even, but not so with David. David is the only David in the entire Bible. There is only one. And he is important, not just because he's the only one that's named that, but I believe he has some things about him that make him unique and single him out individually as someone for us to take a look at. Um, His name, David, David in the Hebrew means beloved, beloved. And he certainly was loved, not so much by his family, but certainly by the Lord. Um, there is no commentary as we look at this six-pack, if you will, bundle of men in the 32nd chapter, but we do know much about him, don't we? Um, again, I smile because David had a lot of flaws. You know, and, and I think that's, as I'm going through this with you week after week, what keeps surfacing in my heart is the reminder that these people aren't in there for perfection. That's not the reason they were there. And I think sometimes people can read that and think, oh, they are the rock stars of Christianity and the church and Yahweh. No, they had lots of problems. And this guy had more than the average. I think the reason that they're listed and they're the way they are is because they were just available to the Lord. They had hearts that, that repented quickly. They had hearts that were after God's heart. Just because you have mistakes in our lives doesn't mean we're not after God's heart. It just means we make some bad decisions in our lives, right? And so that's so much the way he was, and lots of flaws. Of course, I'm going to go through a few with him. A big memory for all of us would be his adulterous affair with Bathsheba. Um, something else you may or may not know is he was a very passive father. In fact, if you ever do a study on David, I've never done one that this didn't show up at some place along the journey. He had a lot of passiveness as a father, and it caused problems in his entire family because of it. Let me give you a little background. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 1 that as David progressed in years, that one of his sons, Adonijah, decided he was going to be put himself, himself. David didn't put him there, and neither did God, but he was going to put himself in position as the next king. And as he saw David approaching, you know, near the passing over of his death, he decided, I'm going to get some generals, I'm going to get myself a cabinet together, and I'm going to align myself to take over the throne of my father. Look at it, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Then added, add did not... Adonijah, son of David's wife, he had a few, right? Hagatha, exalted himself, saying, you see that key word, exalted himself. The eldest living son will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots, horsemen, and 50 men to run before him. David, his father, had never in his life displeased him by asking, why have you done so? Are you seeing what I'm saying? It wasn't just this moment. It said that David never in his life, how could you have a child and never in their life sit down and say that was not the right thing to do? That was, you should have handled this this way. Next time, think about something else, something for it. I mean, we can all relate to that as parents, can't we? But the word of God tells us, and the wording of it is, is kind of interesting, but what he's really saying is he never disciplined them. And that's why I say David was a very passive father, very bold and very uh, eccentric when it came to God. And yet his family, it was a whole other story. And it created problems in the family. And so it goes on to say that his life displeased him by asking, why have you done so? He was also a very attractive man and was born after Absalom, okay? David never challenged him. Never is the word. Never challenged him, never corrected him, never interfered in his life. Do you know as parents, part of our job, you are God-ordained to be an interferer in your kids' lives? We're supposed to do that. Now, there's an age at which that could become a problem, (laughs) right? I mean, when your children become adults, we have to learn how to handle adult relationships with them. But you always will have influence. 
But when they're young, you're supposed to be an interference. There's no doubt about it in their life. Ask questions. Be nosy. When their cell phone, which is on your plan, find out where they are. Look, see, track them. Read their texts. <gasps> really? Oh, they would be so mad if I did that. God invites you to interfere with their lives. See, if their phone is on your plan, then, it's you, then you have a right to know what's going on with that. I think we have a generation right now where we respect the kid more than the kid respects the parents. Don't even get me there. Dever, David apparently never used the app, Find My iPhone, when it came to his family, okay, even though he was paying the bill. So love your children enough to interfere in their lives because God disciplines those he loves. There's, there's a right way, of course, to do it, but we see here, and we're not done with the story yet, this did not work well with David. Then in 2 Samuel 13, we read about another one of David's sons, Ammon, who raped one of David's daughters, who knows her name? Tamar, that's right. They were half-brothers, okay, um, and sister. It says that David was furious when he heard about all that had happened, but you know what? He did nothing again. He was mad, he was furious, but he did absolutely nothing. And that trickled down and rippled out to the point that after the rape of Tamar, she was sheltered in her brother's for two years in her brother Absalom's home, okay? Absalom was David's third son, okay? 2 Samuel 14, 25 says this. Now, Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in all of Israel. He was flawless from head to toe. Wow. Have another cookie, ladies. It's okay. Yes. Amazing. Flawless from head to toe. So there was, he used that as people do. You know, it's interesting. Like people use their outwardness sometimes to draw people in. But how many know when you get to know somebody, all of a sudden, the inner beauty is what shows and what was revealed. And somehow, if the, if the inner is not beautiful, if the inner is evil, even the outward will start to change in the perspective, won't it? Amazing, though, that the, this is the, the NLT's version of that. Absalom kept silent for two years about what had happened to Tamar and the fact that David did nothing about it whatsoever. Yet, the scripture tells us, and we know by the narrative of the story, that his anger just began to brew and brew to the point that rage started coming up, to the point that the rage thwarted him into having a vengeful plot to take place. What was it? He had Ammon killed. He had him killed, absolutely. And he fled for three years after that, only to be begged back by his father, David. David never corrected him, but he loved him. He wanted him back day and night. He wanted him to come back, and he did come back. And what happened is David, the plot, began to be vengeful again, that he wanted to overthrow King David's rule and reign. After much family drama that took place, and I'm giving you a long, long history of time and surmising it into some sentences here, but after a long, long period of time, an actual physical battle between the men of David and the men of Absalom arose up. It, amazing. This is one family, okay? And, and remember, this is all nestled down in the context of passivity as a parent. We think passivity as a parent brings peace. Passivity as a parent, when we are supposed to correct... When we're supposed to discipline, I'm going to take a little sidebar here because I hear all the time to this day parents say, well, I don't give my child everything because I don't want to spoil them. You don't spoil your children by giving them gifts. You don't spoil their children by giving them things. You spoil your children by not disciplining them. That's what spoiling your children is. Spare the rod, spoil the child, the word says, right? So whether it's a rod or whatever it is and whatever your form of punishment or discipline is, do it. Do it, because this passivity of him, maybe he was distracted. There's many sermons on David with passivity as a father, many. And maybe his, he, was, he wasn't paying attention to his home because he was too busy doing other things, roles and positions and titles. But yet he's in this hall of faith. 
here in chapter 11. So anyway, this drama continues till there's a little physical battle between the army or the soldiers or the backings of Absalom versus David and his troops. And this happened, 2 Samuel 18. Absalom unavoidably met the servants of David. Absalom rode on a mule, and the mule went under the thick barrows of a great oak, and Absalom's head got caught fast in a fork of the oak. And the mule under him ran away. So you get the picture, right? He's kind of hanging by his hair, leaving him hanging between the heavens and the earth. This is where this is kind of coming to. Then verse 14 tells us this. Then Joab, which is the commander of David's army, says, I cannot linger with you because he wanted to know, did you, did you take him down? And the soldier said, oh, the, no, I can't do that. I can't touch the, the son of God's and king's anointed and all that. And Joab says, I cannot linger with you anymore or discuss this. He took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart. This, can you even imagine? Well, he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. Absolutely phenomenal. Samuel 18 goes on into great depth about the great grief. Just the, it's one of the saddest portions of scripture. I would encourage you to read it. Again, Samuel chapter 18, 1 Samuel chapter 18, uh, 2 Samuel, I'm sorry. Um, it deals with over and over David just repeating Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom, if, if I could only have taken your place, if only this could have happened, if only that could have happened. But David was a very standoffish parent. He wasn't involved. And you see what happened. The fact that he wasn't involved in one of his children's life affected them all. They took matters in their hands, not to say that that was his fault, but the truth, the fact of the matter is it's set up a conspiracy, if you will, amongst their, all their family members. There was, that's why I believe there, that when it came time for the temple to be established, God did not give that to David, did he? No. He, he, we're going to see he was the one who procured the area, but he was never allowed to build it because he said he was a man with blood on his hands in lots of ways, even in his own family. Can you even imagine coming to a place where your children are in such war that there's a battle between his side and my side and, 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 and your child ends up dying? It's just absolutely, positively amazing. O oh, Absalom, O oh, Absalom, over and over and over that was said. David's parenting was often not on point for sure. Also, 2 Samuel 24 tells us of a time David counted his army throughout Israel. You remember that story? And the Lord was angry with David that he did so. And so the Lord gave him, again, this is, you know, you can read through this in the 24th chapter. The Lord gave him three consequences that he could choose from. I always thought that was interesting. I remember when my father disciplined me, he would give me a choice. You can stay in or you can get spanked. I always took stay in. I don't know why I did that. I should have just got it over with. Anyway, anyway. Well, cause, and because he never let you out earlier, so that, that wasn't the reason. Anyway, three consequences. And one of the famous things that David says is that he says to this angel, uh, whatever God says, because I'd rather fall into the hands of God than man because he's so merciful. But these are the parts of David we see, his connection with the Lord and his strong desire and and just he repented quickly and he got right back where he was supposed to go and where he's supposed to be over and over and over david said this in second samuel 24 he repented and placed his trust right in god rather than numbers he repented of that and that's what was happening he went and had all the tribes counted because they were about to enter a war and he wanted to be confident so what did he do he counted men and he quickly came to the realization that there's no winning in men. David is the one who took down Goliath. See how quick we can forget things, right? We can forget those things so quick. So by the direction of the Lord and the angel, he went and he built an altar to sacrifice at a threshing floor. After this was all made and you know the, a plague came upon Israel and the angel of the Lord held back after many were killed, held back the destruction in Jerusalem. And the angel was sent to David. He said, go to this threshing floor, 
and repent, provide an offering. And that's exactly what he did. Interesting to note that the altar was purchased from Arana, the Jebusite. Let's see, it's 2 Samuel 24, 22, and 24. Now, Arana said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for a burnt sacrifice and threshing elements and the yokes of ox for wood. All these, O king, Arana has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. Then the king, David, said to Arana, no, I will surely buy it for you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, that which cost me nothing. That is a very famous and sermonizing place to, to take a look at. I mean, because that's what we do sometimes. You know, we offer up to God things that really aren't that important to us. Like, you know, if you want to go on a fast and fast liver, you know, I, I, I don't know how much of a sacrifice. I mean, maybe for some of you that might be, it would not be one for me because I don't have it come near my mouth, right? But yeah, but like that's, I love what he said. I will not. I will not offer up to something to God that cost me nothing. Because it sure cost God all eternity to offer up a sacrifice for us, didn't it? So David bought. He didn't just borrow it. He didn't just take it. He bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. That place, my sisters, or property is the most sought after, the most sought after and fought over property on the planet. Why? Because this is the place that he bought. That's the place. He bought the Temple Mount. So that very day, like, look at that. And this was this would be the place. Let's take this to its extreme now. So he bought this. Let me show you the place where the, the old temple sat upon. You know, this was the temple, man, more of an you know, antique type of a, a, a setting. So he bought this, didn't have a gift to him, because we were going to be bought there. Amen. So that continuation of, I'm not going to sacrifice something that doesn't cost me, it cost Jesus Christ eternity, separation from God to provide that. Little did he know he was being so prophetic at that time as that was taking place. So he bought this after this Deb Jebusite, um, right there, and this is where we have fights and rock throwings, and to this day, this is the place, and it's the place where another temple is going to be built, and it's the place where we're all going to see, every eye that's a believer is going to see, we're going to be ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, and we're all going to see this, and I'll tell you, there's nothing like the site. Anybody who has any Bible knowledge whatsoever, when you go to Israel and you stand on that Mount of Olives and you look, or even as we leave the Dead Sea area, we make our way up to Jerusalem, and one of the first things we see is we go through the tunnel. Who knows what I'm going to say? We go through that tunnel, and we start ascending up, and there to your left, it sits. And it just, it just something leaps in you. The Spirit of God just leaps there's something about that place for a believer that is just so precious, so precious because our Lord sacrificed his life there, and that's so much more to say and that I could say. So where are we at? So um, it, it's an amazing thing to think of all that he did and all that he was, and I have no idea where I'm at. So, <clears throat> yes, okay. Okay. Um, but David's name, even with through all this, David's name is in Hebrews chapter 11. There's more. We could spend weeks looking at David's life. I would love to do that actually sometime. But there's so many things. But you know what else we have? We have 150 Psalms that the bulk of them were written as a response to some of the flaws that he had in his life. Some of the things that, you know, they, they're songs to sing. He was a musician. He was in the fields with sheep and just worshiping and praising God. And he just was a special, special guy. And yet he had these flaws. Um, and so I don't want you to think for a minute, and I've been corrected thinking to myself, these are not 17 people 
and honorable mentions beside the 17 that are these lofty, unattainable people that, oh, that's them, the big faith people. No, they all had flaws, and that's one of the reasons I've taken my time to go through this, so you'd be encouraged that even in the midst of your flaws and my flaws and our flaws, God still has a plan. He still wants to use us. He still wants to take those flaws, and he wants to use them to help others with their flaws. He wants to use those flaws to groom us and show us and, and, and to give us a greater perception of Christ that he died for those flaws. Amen? So he had so many, but I will tell you something. He used them all and gave them all to the Lord and repented of every single one of them. Say amen to that, amen. right? One of David's greatest moments is when God decided Saul has to go. And he tells the prophet Samuel to go to the house of Jesse and appoint the next king of Israel. Jesse has how many sons? Eight. <laughs> Samuel doesn't know which one it is. Samuel just goes, okay? He goes there. He says to Jesse, get your sons, line them up. And Sachiko, you're right. When he lines them up, there were seven that he lined up. So you are right. Uh, which one was left out? David. David. Didn't even, th can you even imagine? Didn't even think. Oh, actually, I mean, it was almost like he doesn't even remember he has an eighth son. But how many know eight is the number of new beginnings? Yeah right? So he has this son and he doesn't line them up and the prophet just goes down the line. No, not him. No, not him. No, not him. And so finally Samuel says, is there anybody else in the house of Jesse? Anyone else? Oh, oh, you know what? Yeah. Yeah, David. I mean, he smells like sheep, but you know, but yeah, there's him. And so sure enough, this, you know, Bible theologists are not positive on this, but somewhere between 11 and 15 years old, David is at this point. He's a little guy, okay? And David is brought before this prophet. And I love that Ray Bolt song. When others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. Mm. Mm. What does he see in you? Others may see you this or that or some other label. But guess what? When, when others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. Even though our lives are filled with ordinary things, he still sees bigger than we see. He calls out bigger than we call out. And this is, you know, again, this little guy, he's between, somewhere between 11 and 15 years old. He's brought before the prophet, and he's anointed at this young age. He won't assume the throne for about 30 years. He'll, he is 30 when he assumes it. So it's somewhere between 15 and 20 years before he assumes that throne. It's interesting, 30 years, just as Jesus was 32. And then the first time he is exposed uh, in action is in 1 Samuel 17 when David takes on Goliath. We see this faith demonstrated even as a young boy. Even as a young boy, God just was drawn to David because David had great faith. 1 Samuel 17, 37 says this. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, this is a good plan, and the Lord be with you. Again, this is an 11-year-old or a 12 or a 13-year-old. Here's Saul, the mighty king, uh, leader of Israel. Good idea, David. Why don't you go? I, I, I want you to know that not one, not one in all of Israel would stand up to this Philistine giant. Not one in the army. He was about nine feet tall, we know. David had such relentless confidence. That's what he had, that he didn't even hesitate. I mean, he didn't say, oh, I better go pray about this. He had such confidence in the covenant that he had. In fact, he called him an uncircumcised giant because that's covenant talk, right? What is covenant? Covenant is we get all the, all the strength and we get all the better and we exchange the weakness, and that's what God did with us. He gave us his strength for our weakness. And so he didn't hesitate for a minute to stand at this child at, in front of Israel's biggest physical, 
and spiritual enemy. First Samuel 17, 45 through 47 tells us, David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen. He's got a slingshot. How many know how many stones he had? Why did he have five? No, because he had brothers. He had brothers. Goliath had brothers. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. That's all he had. That's all he had. But how many know that's enough? The name of the Lord is a strong tower that the righteous run into and they're safe. The name of the Lord, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defiled. This day, look at him. This is a little kid. This isn't some warrior that's been practicing for 20 years. This day, the Lord will deliver you in my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Now, you can't tell me that Jesus wasn't standing up on the throne and saying, Amen. Amen. I said, Amen to that. Then all of this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I mean, and that's exactly what happened. They walked around with his head. I mean, I know some of you may have a deer. I, I, I've been in um, Teresa's mom and dad's house, and down in their downstairs, they have a deer head. I'm going to talk to Pat about that tonight. Yeah, I mean, imagine having Goliath's head in your house, right? I mean, that's pretty, pretty amazing. So amazing. And you know what happens at the end? God wins. Because by faith, God always wins. Amen. By faith. Faith is what we, we, we utilize to overtake the world, right? The reason God has David in the hall of faith, even with all his flaws, was what? Just as it's known, the theme over him, he was a man after God's heart. What does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? It means he had a heart after God, which meant he was quick to repent. It means he was humble. He understood his weaknesses and his errors and wrote Psalms as many reflections. When you read the Psalms, put next to it an ability, a commentary, or have a study Bible, a reference Bible that can tell you why this psalm was written. And you'll see so often they were a direct result of some of the flaws and changes and, and victories too in his life. They weren't just written because all of a sudden, you know, the angel of music came upon him. They were a direct reflection. Now, when you read the psalms with that in mind, and you could put it maybe in your own personal life and things that you're going through relational to David too. This is the house of God, our family. This is the house of God. This is our family. Can, can you even believe this? I can't wait to meet him someday. Can, we're going we're gonna to be in all eternity with David. And, and I think I have in one of your notes, if you could meet him, what would you ask him? What would you ask him? If David was teaching today, what would you ask him? It's a great man of God and something we can really... Some, anyone that's after a man after God's heart, we want to learn more about that. And don't expect it to be flawless. But look at the character that was in him beyond the flaws. Amen. The next one up to bat in the hall of faith is Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. He is the last of our 17 mentioned by name names. Samuel was used by God to anoint, as we said, King David. We have two books in the Bible written with his name. Which, what are they? The, see what I'm saying? <laughs> you guys are so smart, right. Um, he had very humble beginnings. His mom, Hannah, which is where we get Hannah's heart from when we have our prayer time on Saturday morning, his, his, she was unable to conceive. And his, her husband had, sometimes I'll do a message on that, had a, uh, another concubine, and she used to just constantly bring that in front of, you know, in front of her. She had these children and Hannah had none. And so Hannah makes this veil. She makes this veil that if God would bless her and enable her to conceive, that she would dedicate this child all the days of his life 
to the care of the Lord. Well, the Lord did answer that. She conceived a child, and his name was Samuel. Uh, Shuma, we could say, coming from two Hebrew words, Shuma and El. And it literally means to hear God or God hears. Okay? Interesting, because that's exactly why she named him that, because God heard the cry of her heart. I love that name, Samuel, right? Um, True to her word, when he was weaned, which back then... We, they didn't wean at six months or three months or even a year. You, you breastfed for five months or five years, I mean. So he was about five years old. We, we know from some history. She took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh, and she gave him to Eli. He was the priest at the time to bring him up in the ways of the Lord. Can you imagine? You would think she would be in the hall of faith, wouldn't you? But she's not listed in that. Nevertheless, she's a wonderful woman, and we name our prayer time Hannah's heart because I believe prayer births things, right? God hears, God hears. And so Samuel's come every single Saturday when we pray together, so you should think about joining us at some point. Well, Eli is the priest at the tabernacle in Shiloh at that time, and he's a very evil priest. He's not a good guy, and one of the reasons he is an evil priest is because of his children, they are the ones whose children are absolutely wicked, okay? And he does not restrain them either. He doesn't restrain their wickedness. He ends up falling backwards on a, and, and breaking his neck, and, and he dies. But anyway, before we get to that, Samuel is there in the tabernacle, and one night, one night they're in bed, and Sammy hears someone calling Samuel. Samuel. He gets up, he goes into where Eli is, and he says, did you call me? And Samuel says, no, I, I, I didn't call you. Go back, you know, go back to bed. Well, it happens again. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel gets up. He goes in with Eli. He says, you, do, do, you know, here I am. Did you call me? He's like, ah, I, don't, I didn't call you. You know, you know, go back to bed. What happens three times? Finally, on the third time, he says, I'm telling you, you little brat, I didn't call. Oh, yeah. Mm, wait a minute. And he tells Samuel to go back and lay down. And he says, listen for your name again. And this is the story, 1 Samuel 3, 7 through 11. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. So he arose and he went to Eli and said, here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, speak, Lord, which is his name, right? Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went, and he laid down in this place. Now the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, behold. I will do a something, a thingamajig, a what do you call it, in Israel, at which both ears of everyone who hear it will tingle. So God used Samuel in an amazing, mighty, mighty way. In fact, I have to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, I think he is the greatest prophet there was. He's an amazing man, pretty and again, he's not there with a big, long narrative. He's, his name is mentioned, but he was a mighty man. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Samuel, again, he, he, if not the greatest, one of the top greatest of all the prophets of Israel. His character and his integrity were stellar, absolutely stellar. He said what God told him to say. He did what God told him to do. And he went where God told him to go. And he didn't question it at all. He had immediate obedience because, you know, delayed obedience is disobedience. He didn't have delayed obedience. He always did what God said to do. Samuel was the last of the judges before the monarchy was put in place. You know what I mean by that. The people uh, of Israel began to look around at the nations of the world around them, even though they were not Yahweh-controlled, Yahweh uh, loved and cared for, yet they wanted what the world has. Oh, somebody, come on. They wanted what the world has. 
We can't get sucked into that. We are in the world, but we should not be of the world. And they wanted not just to be in the world, but they wanted what the world had. They wanted to be of the world. And they started just constantly asking for a king. They wanted a king. They wanted a king. They wanted a king. And so Samuel was very involved in the beginning of the monarchy. He's the last of the judges and then the beginning of the monarchy. So he carried over into that uh, you know, dispension of time. And Samuel anoints this first king of Israel, whose name is what? Saul. Right. And he also had the privilege, as we've learned, of, of anointing David as the sec- second king before he passes. There's not enough detail. And there certainly is not enough time to tell you the drama that he went through with Saul. I, I mean, it's worth the read. It's just worth the read because Saul just was a man who just wanted position and he wanted respect, and he wanted all these things, but he did not lead the people toward the heart of God, whatever. I love that song. You know, your spirit, Jesus, leads us right to the heart of the Father. So there's not enough time for us to even go into the detail of that, but Samuel was just so integrous when it came to Saul. He was reluctant even to to uh, pour the oil upon him because he knew in his heart that that Yahweh was to be their king, that that it would be trouble for a worldly king, a natural king, even out of the tribe of Israel, which we know he was from the tribe of Benjamin, to come into play because there was always that likelihood that things would fall off, and certainly they did. Again, I think Samuel's the greatest prophet besides Jesus because Jesus is not just king and lord, right? And, and he's prophet. He's the, in fact, he's the only one who holds the, the office of prophet, king, and priest, the only one who holds that. Um, the verse ends saying this, Hebrews 11, 32. We're leaving verse 32. And what more should I say? For the time would fail me to tell. Well, it hasn't failed me. Anyway, the time would fail me to tell Gideon, Barak, Samson, uh, Jephthah, also David, we just looked at Samuel, and the prophets. So that's the end of the named names, including some unnamed prophets. Okay, he includes them. Let's go to verse 33 and 34. Who through faith, we're talking about these plus the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned in flight the enemies of aliens. I mean, again, there's some, you know, pointed laser beams that you could say, hmm, that sounds like so-and-so, that sounds like something. As a matter of fact, we don't know these names, but when we hear about shutting the mouth of lions and quenching fire, we think of Daniel. So it's highly likely that could be. Verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So who might this be talking about? Well, the Shumite woman that was with Elijah and the woman from Zarephath who was with Elijah received both their sons from the dead. They are women, and probably that's what is being referred to here. Verse 36. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonments, probably Jeremiah and probably Joseph as we look at their stories, right? Verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, not a mink in the bunch, Uh, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Interesting, sawed in two. Rabbinic tradition tells us that that is the picture of what happened to Isaiah that Isaiah was literally sold into. And then the final three verses, 38 through 40, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens, in caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Now, hold on, because that's probably not what you think it means. And then the last verse in Hebrews 11 is, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What does all that mean? Well, it means this, that the ultimate promise that they did not receive was Jesus. 
That was the ultimate promise that they didn't get to see. Yet they had faith only having a glimpse at the promise. They had faith only with that, just a glimpse to that promise. They, what am I saying? They saw Messiah from a distance, but not in reality, not in their storyline. So the writer, who we believe is Paul, of Hebrews is saying, how much more should we, who do have the revelation, we do have the revelation post-cross, how much more should we be women of faith than those that only had a glimpse? That's what he's saying. That's bringing this all together to that statement. How much more us post-resurrection have even more faith than they did who only had just a a bird's eye look, just a little glimpse, a little Venetian blind opening. (laughs) Wow. See, during Jesus' days in the grave, mm, he preached. He preached. He preached preach that I am the fulfillment of the old covenant. I am the long-awaited Messiah of Israel, and by my blood, you are saved once and for all. He emptied out paradise on the Hades side. Mm. That's what he did those three days. Part of what he did, besides paying for all our sin, is he went to all these that we just read about. This is why he concludes it with They wandered here and they did all that, but they hadn't contained, they didn't obtain the good testimony. They had received the promise. But guess what? They did. When Jesus was in that grave for three days, he went to the paradise side of Hades and he preached to them, I'm Messiah. I'm the fulfill. This is what the whole old covenant was talking about. It's my blood. It's not the blood of bulls, goats, and lambs. It's my blood. And he preached to them and he emptied out paradise again on the Hades side, which is what Luke 16 is all about. He went into the bosom of Abraham, that holding tank, if you will. It's where the Catholic Church thinks limbo still is and purgatory. You're waiting for something. No, because the new covenant believer is absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It is called once for men to die and then judgment. There's no holding tanks anymore. This was set in place so that the old covenant saints, prophets, kings, and whatnot could be preached to. And they had to make it. Nobody just gets into heaven. They had to make a decision where they believe this Jesus is the Messiah. I am just amazed by that. He ushered them out of paradise, and there these saints are gloriously kept in heaven right now. They're just gloriously kept. And where we will join all those who believe in Jesus, we will join them. So if these, for those who are before Jesus exercise such great faith, come on, somebody, how much more should we walk by faith and not by sight? I want to end today with just three verses, three verses from chapter 12. So not only did we get out of verse 32, we got out of of the 11th chapter. We're even encroaching the beginning of chapter 12. I'm going to teach about it next week, but I just want to read it because it goes together. Why does it go together? Because the first word in chapter 12 is therefore, Mm -hmm. therefore. And we always ask ourselves, why is it therefore? right? It's a conjunction. These first few verses join themselves with chapter 11 and give us some insight. So let's see, 12, 1 through 3, therefore. Why is it therefore? It's therefore because it's putting together the 11th and 12th chapter. We also, okay, so now we've moved now into the new covenant reality believer right now, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, not looking into swords and shields and spears, not looking into position, looking face to face, head on into the eyes of Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your very own souls. Amen. That's amazing.
my, 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 we are surrounded by winners. We're surrounded by, there's not a loser in the bunch. We are surrounded by, when, touch your neighbor and say you're a winner. winner. Ask them if they need another chocolate chip cookie. It's, it's National Chocolate Chip Dough Day or however you, you, you word it, right? You're a winner. I'm a winner. We are all winner. And next week we're going to talk a little more about that. Would you stand? As you're standing, I just want to play just something to just encourage you on the way out. My sisters, we got to think bigger. We got to believe bigger. See, Sarah, so many examples like this. Sarah wanted a child. God wanted a nation. He always wants more and does more than we hope, imagine, think, or ask because he's an exceeding, abundant God. Amen? And I'm telling you, no matter how you're seen, no matter how you see yourself, God sees bigger. God sees mightier. What's the key? Chapter 12. Looking. Running that race. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Enjoy this song.